Hey everyone, welcome to the first of two presentations where my goal is to help you understand how being obese affects your immune system. Now, no one enjoys being sick. Bacteria, viruses, parasites, all of these are able to infect us and cause illness. Thankfully, our bodies are equipped with an immune system designed to protect us from these pathogens. But our immune system doesn't always win out. Infectious diseases have been responsible for the largest global burden of premature death and disability throughout most of our evolutionary history, taking a backseat to chronic diseases only within the last two to three decades, thanks to improvements in sanitation and medications like antibiotics and vaccines. At a global level, infections are currently responsible for about 15% of all deaths. But most of this comes from developing nations where infectious diseases remain the leading cause of death. I'm not talking about complex viruses like HIV either. I'm talking about respiratory and intestinal infections. The sad truth is that developing nations are fighting a battle of starvation and poverty. It's been known for some time that infectious risk and malnutrition are linked in a vicious cycle where malnutrition impairs our immune defenses and increases the risk of becoming infected, which in turn can cause malnutrition. There aren't many malnourished folks in developed countries like the US, yet respiratory infections are still the sixth leading cause of death and the seventh leading cause of lost life due to premature death. That's more than diabetes, stroke, or breast cancer. Why? How? While a lot of infectious focus has been given to malnutrition, it turns out that being on the opposite side of the energy spectrum can really take a hammer to the immune system too. What may come as a surprise to you is that the link between obesity and infectious risk wasn't heavily investigated until relatively recently. It all started around 2009 with the H1N1 flu pandemic, one that was estimated to claim the lives of 150 to 575,000 people. Researchers from across the world were interested in figuring out what made some people more susceptible to contracting and dying from this virus. When the researchers from Paris University in France meta-analyzed the data from six studies, they found that obesity was associated with an eightfold greater risk of hospitalization, and a twofold greater risk of death. When researchers from China meta-analyzed 20 studies with over 25,000 flu cases, they found that obesity was associated with an 80% greater risk of dying from the flu, a 67% greater risk of having some form of critical complication like respiratory distress syndrome, and a two-and-a-half-fold greater risk of having some form of a severe complication that wasn't life-threatening. In light of the evidence surrounding the H1N1 flu, John Beagle from the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases sought to determine how obesity impacts the risk of flu-like illnesses in general. So him and his team looked at over 3,000 adults that sought medical attention for flu-like symptoms, and they investigated how their symptom severity related to their body composition after taking into account important things like age, sex, and chronic diseases. Expectedly, Beagle found that being underweight was associated with a three to five-fold greater chance of hospitalization for the flu and other respiratory tract infections. However, he also found a threefold greater risk with obesity and the flu, and an 18-fold greater risk of morbid obesity and the flu. Regardless of body weight, those that had chronic diseases like diabetes and heart disease, which obesity increases your risk for, were at a four to five-fold greater risk of hospitalization. Basically, there's a U-shaped curve when it comes to body weight and the risk of infection, where being either underweight or obese is a risk factor. Of course, these are merely observations, meaning that we can't say for certain that obesity causes worse immune function. And that's precisely what Peter Eckhike and colleagues from the National Institutes of Health took issue with. 
to gain a better understanding of how body weight impacts survival when infected with bacteria or viruses, they conducted a systematic review and meta-analysis of 21 studies in mice and rats that became obese through either genetic or dietary means. Obesity caused premature death in 19 of the 21 studies. Compared to being at a normal weight, obesity reduced the chance of surviving the infection by 80%. And the greater risk of dying was seen with both bacterial and viral infections. One reason for the worst outcomes with obesity is simply that excess fat mass and a state of low-grade inflammation impairs lung function and the ability to breathe, which has obvious implications for the severity of respiratory infections. However, the far more relevant reason behind worse infectious outcomes in those with obesity is that obesity impairs immune function. This is why viruses are able to replicate or shed not only to a greater extent, but also for a longer period of time in those who are obese compared to those who are at a normal body weight. In fact, the obese body may be the perfect environment for viruses to establish a foothold. In a series of elegant studies conducted by Dr. Stacy Schultz Cherry from St. Jude's Children Research Hospital, diet induced obese and normal weight mice were inoculated with several types of flu viruses and followed as this infection took hold. Obesity not only led to greater mortality and severity of symptoms, but it actually facilitated the mutation and replication of the viruses. In other words, obesity promotes viral evolution, and survival. My goal with this presentation is to explain why and how obesity compromises immunity and creates such an opportunistic environment for infectious agents. To bring our conversation to something incredibly relevant to today, I also want to touch on the relationship between obesity and COVID-19, which is the infectious disease caused by severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2, or SARS-CoV-2. I'm sure we're all familiar with it. While this pandemic is only several months old, it's becoming increasingly clear that obesity is one of the biggest risk factors for severe COVID-19 outcomes, particularly among younger individuals. For example, data from New York show that among those under 60, those with obesity were twice as likely to require hospitalization and two to fourfold as likely to end up in intensive care for COVID-19 compared to those who were normal weight. Similarly, research out of France has found that among those admitted to intensive care, being obese increased the risk of requiring invasive ventilation by over sevenfold. We also have several studies out of China reporting that overweight and obese patients are more likely to have severe COVID-19 infections and more likely to die from them. Some researchers have proposed that fat tissue is a reservoir for COVID-19 and amplifies the inflammatory cytokine storm that causes severe respiratory complications in infected individuals. Collectively, this information has led other researchers to claim that any effective strategy for battling the current pandemic must involve diet and exercise that promote fat loss. By the way, if you're tired of always fighting a cold, taking sick days, and feeling worn out from chronic infections, then your best bet is to grab our fat loss blueprint. Go check it out at theenergyblueprint.com forward slash fat loss blueprint. So before jumping into a discussion on how obesity impacts immune function, we need to understand what the immune system is. I'm not going to go into extensive depth here. A brief overview is all that's necessary. At a fundamental level, the immune system is our body's military force, constantly fighting to maintain our health against pathogens and infectious agents like bacteria, viruses, and parasites. Every bite of food, every breath, every cut or scrape, these all represent opportunities for microbes to invade our body and cause illness. To fight off these invaders, our immune system has developed two military arms, the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. The innate immune system is our first line of protection against invaders and the bulk of our military force. It's composed of white blood cells that patrol the body, attack anything they perceive as an enemy, 
and gather information about the enemy, all of which provides us with a broad, nonspecific defense against invading microbes. Our infantry unit is the granulocytes, the basophiles, eosinophiles, neutrophiles, and mast cells. This is the most abundant type of white blood cell in the body and the ones that battle our enemies in the trenches, using antimicrobial agents, enzymes, and reactive oxygen species to destroy them. Natural killer cells function as our security force, constantly in contact with cells throughout our body to ensure they aren't compromised. If it notices any double agents harboring viruses or traitors that are becoming tumorous, it releases cytotoxic agents that destroy our once ally. The final cellular component of our innate immune system is the intelligence officers, which is represented by dendritic cells and macrophages. These cells specialize in capturing the enemy and extracting intel about their invasion before killing them, which is then provided to the adaptive immune system so that we can generate a specific immune response towards the enemy. Now, the adaptive immune system is our second line of protection against invaders and the commanders of our military force. These cells use the intel given to them by our intelligence officers to determine what type of attack is most effective against the enemy. Helper T cells are the field officers of the immune system, being somewhat removed from combat, but in direct communication with our innate immune forces. They use the information presented to them by our intelligence officers to dictate the movement and intensity of the innate immune attack against the enemy, as well as coordinate this attack plan with our military generals. Another type of T-cell that develops based on the type of information presented by our intelligence officers are cytotoxic T-cells. These guys are the special forces of our immune system called in to eliminate very specific targets with minimal tissue damage, such as cancer cells, cells infected with viruses or bacteria, or cells that are damaged in other ways. The most far removed immune cell from battle are the B cells, which function as military generals that use the information given to them by our helper T cells to produce antibodies against the enemy, which function a lot like a heat-seeking missile. They seek out a specific type of pathogen and either destroy it or make it more susceptible to other immune cells. And lastly, we have the immune veterans, which are our memory T and B cells. These veterans form at the end of every battle and record information about the enemy's face in case they ever strike again. The next time our intelligence officers provide intel about the enemy that these veterans recognize, the retaliation is far more effective and lethal. Ultimately, our immune response towards invading pathogens is a concert between the rapidly acting but relatively weak innate immune system and the slower but far more lethal adaptive immune system. The ability of the adaptive immune system to learn about the enemies it fights is a huge benefit for our survival, as it allows for a more rapid and more powerful response upon subsequent exposures to the same enemy. So, where does inflammation come into play when we talk about the immune system? It's a term that I'm sure most of you are familiar with. At the very least, you've probably heard it thrown around as the cause of numerous diseases. but what is it? Inflammation has always been a somewhat fuzzy and loosely defined concept. If you open up a pathology textbook, you'll find a definition similar to the following. A response to infections and in damaged tissues that brings cells and molecules of host defense from the circulation to the sites where they are needed in order to eliminate the offending agents. Of course, not everyone is happy with this definition. Dr. Irving Kushner from Case Western Reserve University, for example, has argued that this definition is inadequate over 20 years ago, since many conditions associated with inflammation don't involve infections, damaged tissues, or any apparent offending agent. Instead, Dr. Kushner proposes that inflammation should be defined as Quote, the innate immune response to harmful stimuli such as pathogens, injury, and metabolic stress, end quote. 
immune cells release a variety of signaling molecules called cytokines. Those that increase the activity of the immune system are considered inflammatory, and those that soften the immune response and switch it from an attack state to a repair state are considered anti-inflammatory. So when you hear the word inflammation, all you need to do is think about an active immune system. And that's where I'm going to end things for now. In part two, I'm going to explain how obesity weighs down immunity. If you're serious about losing fat in the most efficient and healthiest way possible, then join our online program, where we'll show you how to make the dieting process second nature, lose fat, and keep the fat off in the long run. In this program, we'll take you through 18 of the most powerful science-backed strategies in existence for regaining and retaining that youthful body. We cover everything from fat loss fundamentals like getting enough protein to optimizing sleep and stress reduction to using supplements that actually work, all in the name of fat loss. So if you've been struggling with your weight or you want to push the boundaries of leanness, then you must join our fat loss blueprint.